Bitcoin sees a minor retrace, but things might be flipping around here very shortly. We have some news and data to share with you that might forecast a massive amount of inflows that could potentially be coming into Bitcoin. Also, Michael Saylor does it again. Another $600 million worth of BTC is bought. Now they hold and control over 1% of the total supply of BTC. We have some news with Fidelity and their Ethereum ETF. They made an amendment, and this could potentially be an absolute game changer. Also, we have some news and updates for Cardano. We're going to take a look at a Cardano chart. We have Magic Internet Money joining us to break everything down. Why did Bitcoin dip? Where are we headed to next? You do not want to miss today's show. Let's get into it. Hola! Welcome to Sin City Crypto. It's your boy, Big Rob, back in the house. If this is your first time checking us out, we're the Entertainment Focus Crypto Crazy Channel. We take all boring and stale information, repackage that thing up in a fun and sexy way. Man, are you scared? Why would I be scared? Because Bitcoin dumped down to, I saw it down to 63. Hey, man. 63,000. Why would that be? Did you deploy any capital last night with the depth? I am out of capital. You're out of cash. Spend it on a desk. Mm. We just love buying desks. We did buy another desk. Excited? I am excited. There's a lot of things excite me now. You know, I was excited yesterday. It was my wife's birthday. Did you? What did you? Did you get her something nice? I did. I got her my love. I got these new glasses though. They're kind of cool. <laughs> oh, you got yourself something? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I got them before, but they were just ready for pickup. Anyways, we have a lot to talk about today. Let's jump right in. So, Bitcoin did dip. And, well, yesterday was the first time we saw net outflows for the first time since the beginning of the month, the very beginning of the month. Taking a look here at the flows for the Bitcoin ETF. So, BlackRock continues its dominance. Robin, look at how much BlackRock brought in. And look at the next highest one. BlackRock brought brought in 451 million in inflows. The next highest was Bitwise at 17 million. We did see another ginormous outflow. I believe this is the highest outflow ever. Yes, it is. 642 and a half million dollars flowed out of the GBTC fund, the Grayscale Trust. Um, and so that is the most ever the highest ever so curious to see what today is going to look like but gotta remember guys bitcoin is not just in the u.s let's take a look at what happened over in europe they also saw net outflows of approximately 15.2 million dollars but you see here a majority of their net flow is negative negative. Uh, and so obviously we know the united states capital markets are the largest and most the deepest and the most liquid in the world so, of course, they're going to have a bigger impact than something like the European markets and their ETFs. Nonetheless, still important to share that information. Uh, and then, uh, Robin, good news, maybe. Probably not. It'll be too late. Wouldn't matter. Grayscale CEO Michael Sonnenschein says fees on their ETF will be reduced over time. As this market matures, the fees on GBTC will come down. Hmm. I know ETF expert. We've had experts on here. Explain it. I, I just... I. Yeah. What are your it's thoughts on cheaper than it used to be? And the only reason you'd even not sell is because you don't want to take the capital gains hit. That's that's literally literally all it is. And I think the SEC helped Grayscale. I think if the SEC, hear me out here. If the SEC allowed in-kind creation, meaning if I want to sell my GBTC shares, I can request the Bitcoin and then Put that into, let's say, BlackRock or whoever else has a lower uh, expense rate, right? But within cash, they can only give you cash. So they have to sell the Bitcoin to give you the cash. So at that point, Grayscale was probably like, We're, like if people want to take the tax it, go ahead. You're still paying less at 1.5% than you would on a tax hit. I don't know, 100000 a million, $100 million. Who knows how large it is? So... I think that is actually part of the reason why Grayscale's fees yeah, I mean, are still high. 
And the thing is, is, you know, capital gains for the U S somewhere between 20 and 35, 20 and 30%, yeah. but it's uh, quite substantial. You know, you know, if you have roughly two Bitcoin, you know, you're paying, you know, 20 to $30,000 in taxes right up front. Pretty, pretty nasty, bro. So, yeah, I mean, I understand why people are keeping it there. You know, you have an annual, uh, you have the annual fee of 2%. 1.5. Is that what, is it down to 1.5? Yeah, it was too when it was a trust. Mm. But when they converted it, it's, they dropped it. It's not that one point. I mean, that's not that bad. I mean, if, if really? you look, compare no, it to the, rest. no, no, no. If you compare it to other ETF products, other, other percentages for asset managers to, to, to hold, uh, to hold your, Commodities, yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not the end of the world. The only reason it, it it seems so high is because everyone else is closer to zero. That is true, and it's just more of a promotion, just to you know, kind of like you know where you sign up for your cable, your cable, and they, they give it to you for like forty forty dollars a month. I don't have cable. I'm just saying, if you were to get it, get some service, they charge you forty dollars a month. This is two thousand twenty. At the end use of a, a year, use a different analogy. No at one at the cable. end of the year. Next thing you know, you got a hundred and twenty dollar bill, and you're like, oh, the free trial ran up. That's gonna happen to BlackRock. BlackRock, all of a sudden, you're gonna have your account there with BlackRock. I'm like, <laughs> what's, the, what's it? BlackRock? 0.25? 0.5. 0.2, I think. 0.2. Yeah. And yeah, you're gonna have that, and then maybe uh, two years from now, you're gonna look and like, they charging me two percent. Two years from now, can't wait. We do have some. Uh, so we shared some of the bad news. Well, not really bad news, but just some stats. Now let's share some of the potential of. A massive amount of info is coming. So here in this video, this is Grant Engelbart, the vice president of Carson Group, which is a $30 billion RIA platform. And RIA, if you're not familiar, stands for Registered Investment Advisor. Essentially, you're a financial advisor. So this guy saying we're seeing advisors allocate 3.5% of clients' household to spot ETFs. Let's listen to what he had to say. This is on Bloomberg. Grant, I want to talk a little bit about the timeline here. Of course, you onboarded these uh, ETFs about a month or so after they launched, a little, a, month, a little more than a month after. Is that unusually quick when it comes to brand new ETFs? It, it is. In this case, we wanted to act quickly. Uh, we have a due diligence committee that meets every week. Um, we meet as an investment team three times a week. And so we felt we were in a place to be nimble and allow our advisors to, to get access to these products as soon as we could, but also do the proper th thorough due diligence on the underlying. And so we were able to get them out about a month after launch, which gave us a, a good amount of time to kind of get a read of, of where product and asset flows are going to go. And we've seen interest. To, to Eric's question, um, we have seen a, a handful of advisors allocate, on average, 3.5% um, to, to client households. Uh, of course, that's an average with a range and generally in more aggressive accounts. Um, and we over-communicated that aspect of, of things as well, trying to communicate with clients about what these products actually are and also um, how to use them in portfolios appropriately. So for those investors interested in the Bitcoin ETFs that you offer, are they deploying new funds or are they cashing out of other assets on your platform to raise funds to buy the Bitcoin ETFs? Great question. To the extent we can tell, it's usually coming out of an already allocated uh, portion of, of their stock side, uh, side of the house. So usually a growth. Okay. Did some math here, right? So $30 billion is, is how much these RIAs control, right? They're allocating three and a half percent, which equates to roughly about a billion dollars. And you can't see there. Billion dollars. Okay. So you have that. And then what he mentioned is it's not new money. They're rotating out of stocks and they're coming into the ETF. What are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on, on the one billion in potential inflows from just this one RIA company? I, I'm just I've I've been very vocal on the fact that real money, the the institutions and the big money hasn't got into Bitcoin ETF yet, and so these inflows that we've seen have been I I think smaller companies, uh, also hedge funds, but now you're getting uh, you're getting the big boys coming in right, or or at least they're they're discussing uh, their position. 
saying, hey, we want to allocate. How much are we going to do? Let's sit down and have a meeting. What's going to be our attack plan? And so it's coming. The tsunami is coming, bro. The halving is around the corner. The ETF flows, even on the worst days, are... Yesterday was a net negative, right? Mm -hmm. So outside of yesterday, every single day since the ETF went live has been a positive day. And so my, oh, here's my question before I go on to the next piece of news. There's just not enough Bitcoin. And, and, and when the big money comes in and, and then you stack the having on there, there's just almost there was like very low to no possibility i i mean it's just a fraction of a possibility that the price doesn't move up with the supply plus the the demand the supply getting cut in half the supply already not being there's not enough supply now to fulfill orders and then on top of that you're going to cut the supply in half what if i told you that uh the video i just showed and the company 30 billion is just peanuts compared to what the largest pension fund in the world is looking to do. Rocco? Bitcoin gaze intention from Japan's $1.43 trillion pension fund. This is from Watcher Guru, Japan's government pension investment fund, GPIF, noted as the world's largest pension fund with assets totaling $1.5 trillion is embarking on a diversification journey, considering Bitcoin and gold among its investment options. The strategic pivot reflects not just the change in their investment philosophy, but also a proactive stance in adopting the global market landscape or adapting to the global market landscape. Their interest in Bitcoin and alternative assets forms part of a comprehensive strategy to explore innovative avenues for portfolio diversification. Over five years, the fund actively gathers information on Bitcoin and other less liquid assets like precious metals such as gold. It is worth noting that while Bitcoin is under consideration, their inquiry does not guarantee that they will put money into Bitcoin. But, I mean, I think we can all agree that this is something we're going to see more of, right? These large pension funds. I mean, you have the biggest one in the world here. $1.45 trillion. Um, and people are, people are going to copy success, right? We, we talk about it with companies all the time. Hey, someone's going to take notice of MicroStrategy as they climb up uh, the world's ranking, or at least the, the ranking on Wall Street uh, for how much, how much value and how much that company is worth. As they keep getting closer and closer to uh, top, you know, top 100 company as Bitcoin's price keeps skyrocketing, some companies are going to copy them, their strategy, right? They're going to say, you know what? MicroStrategy is on to something. Our position is with gold. We can, have a, an, we can have a similar position with Bitcoin as we do with gold. And I mean, how many companies hold gold, right? A lot. Yeah. And how many, <coughs> other, how many companies are holding gold for, the reason, for, those, the, for those companies that you said a lot? How many of these companies are, are holding gold as a hedge against inflation, right? They're not holding gold because they're using it for jewelry. I'm not trying to be funny, but they're not using it for jewelry. They're not using it for electronics. They're just using it as, um, as somewhere to park their capital that is, one, going to fight against inflation, two, um, you know, in increases in value over time. And Bitcoin does the same thing, but at a lot at an alarming rate right uh, i i have here like here here's a t take a look at this so you have here uh then I'll, I'll rewind this so this is nvidia versus gold versus bitcoin so you can see here that you know this is 2020 and so it's been smart to hold nvidia here hmm. gold is doing very well uh, bitcoin is Nvidia's still doing great, you know. Why? Why even buy Bitcoin? Well, not maybe not for long. Robert. There it is. You know that there it is. There, it is. there it is. There. Look at that. Look at that nice. Look at that Bitcoin. Is wow. So yeah, I mean, you, you can see you can see the power of Bitcoin. If you if you zoom out more than 
than four two up. years, four years, every metric. You zoom out more than four years, Bitcoin outperforms everything. Outperforms the S&P 500. I mean, I mean, look at gold down there in the red. So you're, you're telling me, you're telling me that, you're telling me that your 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 goal, the companies that are holding gold as a hedge against inflation. Hey, it's up twenty percent. Look, thirty percent, right? Yeah, couple but, likes. I mean, and, and Nvidia is doing pretty well though. I mean, you can see here in the little race, but then, then uh, off off to the races. I mean, there you go. I, like I feel like I'm. You never do those horse races at this casino. Yeah, which ones I'm talking about? So, wow, there you go. NVIDIA has outpaced Bitcoin since 2020. Since January of 2020, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Could have just fast-forwarded to that part, but... Yeah. But but the, the moral of the story here is... I know, I'm just kidding. Look at gold down there at the bottom. Peter Schiff must be crying soon. <laughs> uh, I do want to give a big shout-out to our channel sponsor, Legacy Network. Um, you know, as important as it is making money, it's important to have your mindset in the right place and for me personally i know time management's a big one uh i get lost in my time and so there's certain things i do that help me and what legacy network is looking to do is they're looking to bridge the gap between personal development and also being able to make money uh their app is going live very very soon uh they are a sponsor of this channel and we do recommend you join their discord so you can stay up to date on when everything is launching the link is in the description of this video um, and with that being said, we're going to bring on our friend, Magic Internet Money. Magic, what's up, brother? What's going on, guys? Yo. Hey, how we doing? Did you short the markets yesterday? What happened, man? Uh, <laughs> I told you guys, 73,000. Um, but yeah. It, I was wrong, so too. Took a few shorts. I did take a short a little bit ago as well, just for like a day trade. Um, but haven't really pulled the trigger on any longs yet. So what are you waiting uh, for, man? Wait and see. What are you waiting for? Uh, and then feel free to talk talk through this uh, with a Bitcoin chart. Um, and then, yeah, sure. you know, a lot of people are freaking out. Um, is Bitcoin over? Guys, we, <laughs> no. you know, Anthony Pompliano, Anthony Pompliano was on, I think it was Bloomberg or CNBC. And he brought up the fact that, look, in the last bull market in 2020, we saw multiple 30% corrections. We've only seen like 11, 12%. So, Everyone calm down. Okay, it's par for the course. But what is the structure of the mar uh, the chart telling you, Magic? Should we be expecting a rebound here shortly? Or do you think there's more downside to come? Uh, I think the downside to come could be potentially limited. So, you know, you're starting to get in that, um, that area where it's like, okay, maybe we do start looking for opposing trades, like a bounce. Um, main reason being is you want to see if you're going to put in some kind of a, a larger range. Um, we talked about this about a week ago where we said, you know, markets realistically fine above, uh, these levels right here, right? Because this is where people have been buying in. So as soon as these guys are put underwater, they start getting forced out, you know, people panic a little bit and, and things can get out of hand fairly quickly. Uh, we're in log scale, so it doesn't look that far away, but if you go to linear, you know, it kind of dims it up a little bit, but this, this to me is a good way to look at it. Um, your next support realistically is that $53,000 level. If you know, you lose about call it 60 K. Um, we had kind of gone in on the monthly chart and talked about a level. We didn't want to lose if, uh, if it was going to happen. And that was $62,000, right? That uh, it was right here. That 62 K mark. You just haven't closed a monthly above it. Um, you still got 12 days left in March. Nothing is broken here. Um, you know, you don't want to, turn this February high into resistance by any means, and then start, you know, beating the door down of you know, not only your current March open right here and this $62,000 level. Uh, but uh, if you can stay above this level, uh, specifically just going sideways, even you don't have to do anything crazy. It doesn't have to like go all the way back to the highs, but if you can just stay above this level, put in something constructive, like, you know, it's just consolidation. Um, you know, and the other aspect of that, what you were talking about is like, is Bitcoin over? Um, you know, this is the last having right here. Um, I believe it was the May 11th date. Is that, I think that's correct from back over here, right? Mm -hmm. About the last halving. So you did get a dip from about, was that like 10,000 all the way down to like 80, 88,088, which I believe was your yearly pivot at the time. 
Uh, so, you know, decent 20% correction, right? But then sideways, the consolidation underneath resistance. So um, we're at resistance again. We've swept the prior all-time high. Uh, just we're, we're higher up in the chart now rather than being um, at like the gold pocket where we're used to being at the halving, right? So um, to me, the price isn't, I wouldn't say all that important. It's definitely important, but um, time seems to be the more reliable factor here. Um, and that the cycle is still kind of playing out a little bit like the last ones where it's like, okay, we're going into the halving, we're getting that dip finally. Um, and you are getting a little bit of a sell-off at key resistance. And this was key resistance as well, right here. You know, we all knew what was right here at this like $10,000 level. So if price goes sideways here, as long as it's living above about 53, which um, that was our deviation, was it four? I think... Yeah, the the fourth deviation for the year 2023 projected out for 2024. So these are closed levels um, based on volume weighted average price. Um, and this would be your support zone that you'd want to see. Like if I was going to get bearish on the market, it would be below this level, basically. Uh, so anything beyond that, really, uh, should we say opportunity? Yeah, I mean, it's potentially an opportunity for sure. Um, so high time frames. I mean, this is probably how I would trade it. You've got a really nice range low here at about 59,000. Um, historically, about 58 is pretty important. So uh, the only thing to keep in mind is these hit at a 76.8% hit rate. Uh, it is your monthly pivots. Okay, so this thing is coming to a close. This would be the 62nd monthly pivot that I have in that data set. Um, but you are 48 out of 61 going into this one. So it'll either be 48 out of 62 or 49 out of 62, depending on how this goes. So um, if price, you know, loses this $62,000 level, I'm just going to, you know, take it level to level from there down to 59. And then ultimately looking for the pivot, just because from a statistical likelihood, that seems to be um, the play. And nothing is broken at that point. You know, you can put in quite a bit of a, a retracement here. Let me get rid of some of this stuff on the chart to kind of make my point. The chart's been so insanely bullish that the retracement could be quite heavy to be up front with you. Um, How heavy, Magic? I mean, 50K is pretty heavy when you think about it from 73 all the way down to like 53 to 50. Like, that's pretty heavy. Like, it's $23,000. That's going to, if people are freaking out right now over a $10,000 move, imagine another, you know, $13,000 off that. <laughs> They're going to lose their mind. Uh, but, you know, you, you got to think like, as long as we're above this level, things are, are, fairly good. And you can see historically, that's the case. You know, if we live above this level, where do we go? All time highs. That's what we talked about previously when we got up here. If you clear these, you're living above and closing in on 60K. You come back below it and we have to start considering alternatives that maybe, um, you know, this is going to put in a higher low down here. Um, I'm not in the camp of, I, I've seen some people do this. I'm not going to name any names because, you know, there's no point in doing that, but they'll do stuff like this. And I've seen some, you know, stock fractals with them too. Um, if you guys are on Twitter, you probably know who they are, hmm. but they'll do stuff like this where they're, they're saying that this is a, you know, reacceptance back into the range. And this is a very like broad assumption. And then it's going to come all the way back down to here. Um, Magic, are you, you, know, are you sure you don't want to list some names? We can have a little fun here. <laughs> you know, they say, they're, uh, they're, they've already kind of ruined their own credibility in my opinion by, being bearish the entire way up. You know, but, why don't you um, go to yeah. the month chart, zoom out, and then draw that rectangular box all the way to zero? That that would be uh, love yeah, making right. I mean, right? that's yeah. that's ultimate support is zero. Big range, like, guys. It's, it's big range. Support. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> even on the monthly chart, like when you look at fifty, like the monthly doesn't have a higher low until twenty five. So, mm. if you're really zoomed out and going to like the BLX, you know, and you look at something like this, I don't know what I was doing here. Who knows? We'll just get rid of all that. You look at the BLX. I mean, where's your, your monthly high or low at? I mean, your monthly high or low comes in, you know, there's your 20 K top. Boom, boom, boom. And then you still don't even have a confirmed high yet. Yeah. Like you have not even confirmed this high, meaning that this high could continue up potentially um, on the monthly chart. So, you know, it really pans, it pays to, to zoom out here because look at the chart, you know, all these things people are freaking out about um, are realistically inconsequential. If you just look at the chart on any kind of a time frame. the issue that becomes involved is, you know, you guys bring me on for trading is a lot of people get over leveraged um, yeah. and get excited in the market when we get up to these levels and, 
Um, they're very easily flushed out for that reason or, you know, panic. So you could come all the way on the monthly chart. You could come all the way back down to like 25. And this chart technically would still be trying to put in a higher low after making a slightly higher high even. So it's like, you know, is that the most bullish thing ever coming back here? Probably not. But, you know, it's just you get my point. To confirm a high here, though, what would we need to see? Uh, probably have to give up the open and the low, right? So if we go back to a chart that's updating real time, go to your monthly chart and just say, you know, I'm really not bearish on this until we're under 62 because that's kind of the level we've looked at historically. But also I could go in and just say, okay, where's March's low? Where's my open? And this is from a high time frame perspective, probably a level I want to hang on to, right? And you can go down to the daily and where does that line up at? Right at our daily closures we just talked about where we said, you know, if we're going to get a range low in this area, that'd be ideal. Um, you've now kind of dissected it as this is my breakout right here. You can take your breakout candle on over. You can see you're at the value area low. So you are coming into support here, um, getting pretty close to it where it's like, yeah, we could put in a bigger structure here. doesn't mean it won't retrace lower over time. It just means that, you know, probably due for a bounce. And if you're selling right here, it's really not a good idea unless you're doing like an intraday trade. Um, I don't know if you guys want intraday analysis, like the short, short time frames or yeah, what, but we, uh, we, high we, time we, frames are pretty cool. We'd love that, uh, Magic. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of like the the intraday, I really like to break down the daily candles at that point. So, you know, first things first is you got to look at what happened yesterday. Okay. So you want to go in and just say, okay, where's my previous day high? And I like to mark these in white, uh, just like a habit, easier for me to kind of like find them. And I'm going to keep these on here. So that way you guys can actually, you know, know what these are and don't get lost. Hopefully the previous day low also important right? And you could even mark out your previous week low if you wanted to, but I don't think it's as important as maybe the previous day low right now. Um, and then, you know, most importantly is going to be what's the point of control and the value area of this range. And I believe I had it on XO over here. Yeah. So I use XO for this because I just prefer one tick data versus the 40 tick that you get on, um, on trading view and you can come up here and these are just lines I was using to short, which you can see panned out really well. Um, but you can see the previous day vowels all the way at 66,954. So the value area low of yesterday's session is 66,954. So you could, you know, come in here and change this to 66,954. And what we know is we need to get acceptance into this area. Right. And we also need to get back above the previous day low. If, if we're going to see any kind of immediate bounce, um, so straight away, you can kind of see where your resistance is. Uh, where do we go if, you know, we are able to reclaim that? You want to know where your previous day point of control, which is currently naked at 67,500. Um, so just put that on the chart, 67,500. And I'm going to mark that as an NPOC. And yeah, we can just leave it like that. That'll probably be fine. And so that's probably really all we need for right now. Um, you go down to like the five minute, one minute, you could trade this on the, the one hour, whatever is really best for you. So um, what you'll notice is you've got a pretty healthy downtrend after expansion here. You can see your daily naked point of control comes in here and you've come back up and you haven't formally back tested this. But, you know, if you were to pull this from like a gold pocket standpoint, you know, you've probably gotten pretty close to the 618 retrace on it. And that would get you, you know, a decent rejection right there. So oh, wow. you got a log for a second. Yeah, a little front run. So I would expect this to probably come up and potentially take that high. I haven't looked into the order flow of it too much to see if it's going to be a good high or not. But um, I got out of my short trade already. I just took it down to the VWAP. Um, front ran it a little bit, of course. Uh, but yeah, there's your VWAP. So shorting resistance back to what the daily like it's a moving average that's all it is it's a, it's a volume weighted moving average so you know, it should be treated as such it's a mean reversion tool so you know if as long as it's holding on to the vwap it can certainly come back up here and formally take this high and maybe challenge into these areas and you know you can just look at the chart now and say well where, where do i need to get back above if i want to see any kind of a challenge into the old range um this would probably be it you know this would be the easiest way to do it is just to do something like this and you know, map it off and then you could even get rid of this middle line if you wanted to. And we'll extend it to the left. And you can see there's my range, right? It's a pretty decent little range. It's not perfect, but it gets things fairly well. You know, you can see that the high is very well respected. Go to the low, 
get back in the range, go to the high, back to the low, lose the range. You want to get back in it. Um, another thing to look at was uh, yesterday when we came up here and got rejected, it was off of the previous day value or the previous week value area low. So you're now moving up in time frames a little bit, but it's still applicable to the low time frames. Um, and what I mean by that is we went through the previous day data here just because it's relevant to right now. Now we're looking at the higher time frame and saying that the previous week, um, if we can get back in this range, we still need to realistically clear this range and get back into that previous week range because we could then rotate to this inefficiency here at the naked point of control that was left over. Um, and I can tell you that if, if you close outside of this, and this data is from like 21 and 22, I need to do it for 23 still. But you know, if you close the, the, the um, weekly candle outside of the value area, the 70% or 68% um, you know, that you've chosen for this uh, tool, you have like an 84% chance of coming back to this. I think it was 87 actually from 2021 and 2022. Um, so pretty high. Um, you know, very, very high, but the thing is you have to get back in that range. So clearing probably let's call it an even 69,000 or the previous all time high, I guess would be a really nice, even, uh, level to have on your chart. If you're being extra conservative, um, if you get it back above 69, you probably have a nice $3,000 pump, almost to $72,000. And then at that point, you know, you, you do run the, the idea of, well, if we get that high and it continues and yeah, we can make a new high, but more than likely it'll start filling this area in and you'll have a bigger range. Um, and then from there, you're just going to creep the time frames up one more time, I'll clean up this chart and you just creep it up to uh, say the monthly, right? We would just go to the monthly time frame and just say, okay, well now what's my, my monthly look like. And this is really how you go through the progressions of a chart. If you're using a time basis system, like I do, you know, I mean, we start on the daily, where's my daily trade you know, Magic, now here's my monthly trade. Huh? Uh, just real quick. You are one of maybe two people that do charts and analysis on the show that I will go back and rewatch two, three times and take notes because it is so in depth. It is so good. Um, and it's so step by step. It's, it's just, it's phenomenal, man. Well, I used to do this every day on my old YouTube channel for I was banned. <laughs> that thing, that thing went bananas in 2020. Um, but this was the kind of content I put out. I didn't think there'd be much of a market for it, but there certainly is. There's a lot of people that like it. Yeah. Um, but you know, and to the point that we just talked about getting back in that range, now we've got a monthly range to think about, right? Let's say that you come back up to that $72,000, uh, POC right up here at the weekly. That is actually the value area high of your monthly. So now you've got confluence on a higher medium time frame, saying that, well, we realistically haven't changed anything unless we clear this level. So I should probably be looking to take profits and consider this as an overall range. Um, so even if price does get a retrace up here, it can go quite high without actually doing much, but you do still have higher lows in place. Uh, I'm anticipating a lower move still. I'm just not sold on the low that's come in in terms of volume. Um, it's something that uh, open interest will kind of tell you. Uh, it's more of an in-depth thing that can, can take some people months to kind of grasp, but order flow is you know the last thing people usually learn is order flow and you know other things. But yeah, if you come and you lose 62, I'm realistically just looking to challenge into like 59 again um, and then see if I've got a bounce there or if uh, maybe I'm going to stab a little lower and then play the SFP game, which is this being my monthly low, if you recall, on the monthly time frame. We went out to the high time frame and said, all right, the monthly low for March, you know, it's right here. So uh, that would be a key level to have on your chart and, you know, probably a fair amount of stop losses down here. So if you start breaking down, this is the next area I'm interested in and I can trade this. Right. And if it swing fails it. And so for anyone that's not familiar with a swing fail is um, price attempts to break down below it and then reclaims it and up it goes. Or um, alternatively, this is the one that most people struggle the most with is let's say we do get this move like something like this and you come down here and you come up and then you do something like this and it roots around down here, but it's not breaking down. And what you want to look for is net buyers and sellers and like um, cumulative volume delta divergences or if you're an RSI or momentum indicator, whatever you're most comfortable with, um, a lot of times these are failures to break down. So it's not a, a specific swing fail. It's more of a um, uh, failure to push price lower. Some people call it failed auctions. And then you've got, you know, the move up can be quite aggressive because you've built up usually a lot of open interest right here. Um, and a lot of people selling into this fear the really the best example of that I can give, and this isn't to get off in the weeds, just it's on the tip of my mind, was actually the low in 2021. There's a really good 
example of this from all the way over here, believe it or not. And I got to trade this one um, right in here. So you actually had a swing failure level at 29,800, I think was the level. Um, and it was just such a good level right here where you took it. And then you came back below the level right here. And you can see that, you know, on the four hour, because I can't go back that far in like the five minute. Mm. Um, you're living below it and you didn't really swing fail it, but you're just chopping around, putting in uh, higher lows over time here. And I think if you went down to like the one hour, you'd see it's a pretty clean ascending triangle um, and you had massive Delta divergences. So it was kind of like, oh man, if we recover 29,800 and then I think the point of control was 31.2, um, you know, we've got quite a bit of, you know, upside at that point. Yeah. There's 31.2 right there. Yeah. And then that happened. So um, that, that's that why happened. those trades are so good. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're so good because not just like things like that happen, but from a trading standpoint, you know, because I, you guys are delving more into the trading side of things. I've noticed um, you've got a really great place to put a stop loss now, uh, meaning that you've got a bunch of people that created, um, you know, fear at the bottom of the market. They're about to be fuel for upside, yep. and you're not that far away from price. So, in the instance of something like that happening, this is very hypothetical. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but just for an example. Um, you know, let's say you get in like right here and you're like, oh man, we got a wick down to here. You know, you've got a 3% stop loss, but you're realistically trading this potentially all the way back up to, you know, 68,000, 69,000, maybe even $72,000 at that time. Cause now you've got a bigger range to consider, right? If you're trading, this as an overall range. Um, and that's a huge, huge, you know, advantage having a reward system of six to one, like you, you don't even have wow. to win more than like 20 to 25% of your trades to be profitable at that point. Wow. You could lose five trades out of six and be probably good, you know, That's depending amazing. on, you know, your risk management, of course. But what, what was um, that, what was that number yeah. again, magic that, that entry mat, the, uh, the wick that you have out is that 15, eight, nine, uh, 50 right here. Yeah. So March low is 59,088 on Bybit. Um, so depending on the exchange you're on, it'll vary a little bit, but um, realistically call it the old all time high at 69 K needs to be recovered on the low time frames. If it is, you know, you got to think you're living above your previous day low. You're back inside your prior day range. You're back inside your prior week range. You're back inside the monthly range you, you, rotations to $72,000 of that point can certainly take place. Um, and then you should consider range or trend, you know, you kind of have to make that decision in the moment, but I would favor a range at that point. So Magic, sorry, can not I, to get back to that. Or I'll just repeat myself. Can I, can I just ask you just real quick? Um, you know, we've, we, we've obviously broken all time highs, right? We've hit that. Uh, look at that 73 yeah. two, right? What mm -hmm. can you maybe for someone watching who doesn't understand like, well, why can't we like, we hit all time highs. Why do we keep going down? What are some things that you like to see in a chart to where you're like, okay, pro from a probability standpoint, we're probably going to break this all time high and go again. Is it, is it a consolidation period? Is it anything you look for on the chart that maybe you can share with maybe some new people? Um, on, on the chart, it's kind of tough. Um, it's more so just market structure. A lot of times, like when you look at a weekly chart and like you zoom out, it's kind of hard to see that stuff, right? You can see, um, one thing that you do want to see right here. So this is kind of like a little tip and trick, and you can do this with the, um, volume profile as well. This little range, this is a very small weekly candle, right? So you have a really small confined space of price action taking place here, um, which usually means there's going to be a big move. Uh, you know, in other instances where you've had that, where you didn't break out of the range in these cases, what did you do though? When you had a really small wick here, a very small candle and a very small candle here, right? You, you washed one side of the market in this case, and then ran it turbo back. In this case, you washed both sides. <laughs> so you, what you're doing is you're building up positions, open interest. And so when you have a range, you have to look at it as like, um, you know, you've got people that are sometimes on both sides of the ball, but uh, people that are shorting and people that are uh, buying. And eventually one side's going to win out, but they're going to build up positions until that happens. And when you get these really small ranges like this, where people are just building up positions like underneath resistance or support, um, it's essentially, you know, that's what I'd like to see, you know, right here. So going back to this weekly, you know, we could probably go into it and just look and say, you know, on the chart, I know I've got a really small weekly range. There's my entry candle. Here's my exit candle. And we go down like a one hour. We should be able to get over there fairly quickly. There we go. So we've now found our way into the range, very small range, right? What do we, what do we notice right away? Um, 
everybody's going to say higher lows, but in fact, you actually took the low right here, uh, which this is a proper swing failure pattern. So um, what we talked about earlier where we said it just, um, it rooted around underneath there and you got like what's called a failed auction. This right here would be more so um, a, we'll call them liquidity grabs, but you've taken the low, back tested it, support, support, and you're no longer making new lows. And then you've got a higher low here. And what's important to note is, you know, a lot of people are probably looking at this like a triangle, but the most important thing to really pay attention to is, you know, there's really nothing above these highs. There's, there's no resistance mm. here on the chart, right? So yeah. when you see something like this, this is where a breakout can take place because you can run all the way to the high of the range. And then what you're looking for is on this breakout, you know, what does my open interest look like? What is my uh, delta? And you can see straight away here that the OI, this is open interest here, and it's, it's got some interesting color codes, but um, the blue is actually meaning that it's a very aggressive, like um, it's an outlier amount of, you know, deltas coming in or an open interest for the buy side, which um, can be both good and bad. Uh, but in this case, it's good. You know, you've got a very strong uptrend that's coming. And then you can see you have a huge washout right here, which I'd be curious to see where that is. And that's just like a reset, basically. Sometimes it's people taking profits. Sometimes it is longs that just get a little too aggressive. Just kind of depends. Yeah, this would be right here. So we'll get rid of that. Yeah. So huge washout. And then what did you do, though? You left the overall higher low structure. And it's like, again, how, how do we know it's going to continue? We don't. But you can see OI starts building again, right? And taking off. But what did you do? Higher low, higher low another higher low, you're just not giving shorts any chance to get out of their positions at break even at that point. So you're just, if you shorted down here, which a lot of people probably did, you're underwater immediately. You're underwater further and further. And all they're doing is hoping price will come back to these regions. That's why when people say, oh, we need to take the low again. Sometimes it depends on what's down there. If you've trapped a bunch of shorts, um, that's something I'd want to see too. Like if we went back to that range, you know, with that swing fill, what you're looking at when you're in there is you're looking for trap traders sometimes like that's a really good indication too like if you come down here and you sweep these lows and you can see you know you got these wicks which are indications of the you know being bought up but you know in in the theory of the market you have to have one buyer and one seller to you know have an, an interaction so um that's you know market makers fill in but like you've got people that are selling down here that are shorting or selling down here and they're getting trapped um they're becoming fuel for the upside. So if you have a bunch of trapped traders down in this region, and then you've got what we talked about earlier, where you, you've really got no resistance above this level, and you've got a very small range, right? Our range is extremely small and tight at this point, comparatively speaking to the, all the other ones. It's a recipe for a pretty big move at that point. No, um, I wish. And if you see trapped traders on these lows, then you can be like, that's where your confidence will come in that, okay, maybe if we get above this level, I should be looking to hold this longer and just monitor the trend you know, as it goes, um, you know, magic, I yeah, wish, go ahead. You had a question. I wish, I wish we could just trap those short traders there and just trap them forever. You know, <laughs> I hope so too. I don't want to see them get out of those trades because, um, you know, it's one of those things where so, uh, the market is a, so, it's a one V one game, you believe, know? So, and I'm, I'm obviously bullish. At, so it, it's one of those things where, yeah, believe it or not. Uh, there's, there's literally people saying, uh, we're in a bear market. I'm not even kidding. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't think you can say that. So you're below like 50 K and yeah, even then it's like, these people you know, look just, at the chart. Yeah. But do you really think these people look at charts? Probably not. But who does look at charts is our man magic as he just put on an absolute masterclass. Uh, guys, we're going to have Rocco prompt the discord. I'm in the discord. Highly recommend you join magic's discord to get all the analysis, stay up to date on everything. Uh, magic is doing in the magic internet money ecosystem. He joins us every single Tuesday. We love having him on the show. Uh, Magic, thank you so much, man. We appreciate your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, next week. Awesome, man. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks, a good day. Brother. Take care. All right. <clears throat> you know, um, what have you been up to over there? I've been uh, just over here checking out oh, MicroStrategy. MicroStrategy holds 1% of total Bitcoin supply after $600 million purchase. 9,200 Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, they're not slowing down, bro. <laughs> And you know who else is not slowing down? Our Super Chats. We have uh, three new Super Chats here. Or three Super Chats. Well, we have Ricky Romero with 199 Super Chat. Saying, uh, would you rather throw some money at BTC or Soul? Everton Azul 
uh, had a five dollar super chat uh, talking about Cardano stable, and then we had a uh, Kirk Meyer get five dollar super chat, uh, and he was uh, talking about Solana and Aptos with some Google and Visa partnerships. Not not too sure on the details of that, but either way, if you are new here, say hello so we can drop that Ola back at you. We got Stephen Droop, Lionheart, Ger uh, Gerald, uh, Gary Z, Mercy received, Justin Irwin. Harry Hotep, Team Salty, J5, Javier P, to all of you. Hola! Welcome Ooh, to Sin City Credit. So, we have, uh, as Rob mentioned, MicroStrategy buys 9,200 Bitcoin. You have Naib Bukele saying the country will continue to purchase one Bitcoin every single day until it becomes unaffordable with fiat currencies. You also have this from CryptoQuant. Uh, insights from crypto on chain showed a stark drop in Bitcoin miners reserves, the lowest since April of 2021. Robin, Robin, yeah. the reserves are low. Having in 20 some odd days, 30 days. Talked about this uh, just a short while ago. We also had this. For the love of Jesus H Christ. So this is from Zach XPT. I was interested to see how much Solana has been sent as a result of the pre-sale meta and calculated over $120 million was raised from 27 pre-sales. This includes the slurf that uh, the guy accidentally burnt $10 million worth of people's tokens. And, you know, Forrest retweeted this and he said, uh, you know, sadly, a majority of these are, are uh, converted to stables and taken out of the market. So uh, then you also had this from the SEC website on March 18th. SEC developed specialized team targeting illegal ICO pre-sale mania in cryptocurrencies after developer accidentally burns $10,000 in customer funds. Way to go, guys. Way to go. You gave Gary Gensler more ammo. So they developed specialized teams targeting ICOs, huh? Well. Pre-sell, specifically referred to $10,000. You also had this, uh, some bad news for the SEC. Judge imposes sanctions on Gary Gensler and team for acting in bad faith and abusing power in a case against crypto firm, The Debt Box. We also have, uh, well, I'm not going to share this video. Maybe share it uh, tomorrow. But uh, we have this from Rec Capital. Bitcoin will retrace deep enough to convince you that the bull market is over and then it will resume its uptrend. And well, one person seemed to be convinced is that it's one of the worst thing, uh, one of the worst accounts to follow on Twitter, Whalewire. Uh, over 18% of Bitcoin's entire value was wiped out. Uh, as fast as it rose, so too it will collapse. Bear market confirmed. Mm. This is literally one of the worst accounts you can follow. I follow it for laughs. <laughs> um, but just it's like Peter Schiff's yeah. nephew or something. Um, anyways, uh, with that being said, let's move into our, you know, actually I do want to, um, I do want to pull up a Cardano chart really quick. So someone mentioned, uh, the USDM. We're going to talk about that, but I'm taking a look at a Cardano, Cardano chart and this thing is looking a little juicy, man. It's looking a little juicy. So it's been down. So let's measure this down here from the liquidity grab around 80 cents. Uh, we've been down around 23.5%, but you can see here the way price reacted at two levels, right? So we did get a wick down to this order block where we saw uh, two to one buys versus sells. This is also where Cardano, right? This is on the daily, by the way. This is also where Cardano consolidated a, lot of, a little bit and then had a 35% gain. Will we see the same? I don't know, but we're taking a look in real time how price is reacting to this level, which is right around 60 cents, maybe a smidge under. Uh, and then what I'm using here is the Lux Algo price action concepts. Uh, you also have this equilibrium zone where we got rejected back on the 20th of February and then got rejected again and then blew right through it. Well, we've dipped below that equilibrium zone. Also, right smack dab in the middle of it, we're seeing tons of volume 
A lot of buying and selling going on. If we take a look at how price reacted last time, we can assume a lot of that was buying. So also taking a look at some of the other metrics on the matrix oscillator, we are pretty oversold on the, on the matrix oscillator. Haven't gotten a buy dot yet, but that could change. Also on the RSI, we are more towards the oversold than the overbought. Here's what happens. People sleep on a, people sleep on projects like Cardano. They sleep on projects like Chainlink because, you know, you see Solana pumping 60%. Avalanche went from 40 to 60 bucks. Cardano, Chainlink, either consolidating, a little bit down, up 3%, down 5, 10%. And then when you blink, you open your eyes like, holy shit, Cardano's at 80 cents again. Damn, $1. twenty. Damn, $1. sixty. That is how a project like Cardano moves. Uh, and I'm telling you, from personal experience, as soon as you give up and you sell, the, the, price, will, the price will probably moonshot. Um, and so that is what I'm looking at for Cardano. I do want to move on uh, to a segment we do every Tuesday, which is a Ray My Portfolio segment. And today's Ray My Portfolio is brought to you by Decrypted.tax. Um, we know it's important that you make money, but it's also very important that you keep money. You need a good tax professional in your corner to make sure to minimize your tax liabilities. This is why we recommend you use Decrypted.tax. Uh, use the link in the description. Get a free consultation. If you use any of the services, you'll save 25% off. So big shout out to Decrypted.tax for bringing you today's segment. And today's is a good one. Might be the best portfolio we've seen in relation to what their goal is. So, Robin, $1 million portfolio. Their goal is a 3 to 5x, okay? Um, context told me this investor has been in crypto since 2014 and started with only $10,000. This is what it looks like, Rob. 44% of that million is in BTC. The next highest allocation is 21% to Ethereum. Then you have 8.9% uh, Solana, 8.5% Compound, 6.9% Avalanche, 4.3% Filecoin, 2.7% Caspa, and others include, in this order, Optimism, and Dogecoin. So Robin, keep in mind this person's goal. What would you give this portfolio a rating of? I'd like to give him a round of applause, first of all. Finally, we have somebody with some realistic returns. Three to five X, man. Wow, let's see, that's what we need right here, man. Take notes. This is, this is the strategy you should have. A three to five X is, that's a damn good returns, right? Especially on a million bucks. Uh, yeah, a million, you know, it, the thing is, is you start with 10,000, you, you get to a million uh, following this strategy. And, and here's the thing. When did he start? You said? 2014. Uh, 2014. So nine years. Uh, I'm pretty sure majority of the people here probably don't plan on retiring in the next nine years. And so he also told me he has pulled all of the money invested that he invested adjusted for inflation as well. Hmm. Yeah, so you know if you like a smart you, you think about you think about it, you know if, if you don't plan on retiring within the next nine years, you know, following a similar strategy where you have a healthy position of Bitcoin, a healthy position to the top alts, uh, well, you know here Ethereum, and then take a take a couple of flyers with the other 20, 30 percent of your portfolio, and then you expect a what I for for recent portfolio reviews, I would say modest return, but realistically, a three to five percent is an excellent return, uh, especially o over um, you know a longer time horizon with a fat stack of cash. If I told you, Robin, this person is thirty three years old. There you go, man. Beautiful. That is amazing. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna break it down, but you know, there's big no, big I, yeah. There's really nothing. Is this the best portfolio you've seen yeah. so far? Yep. So is it a ten yep. out of ten? Yep. Ten. For, for the goal. Now, here's the thing. You could, if you had different goals in mind, sure, we could tweak that. But uh, for your return, uh, I think I think a 3x, I think I think he's like hoping for the five. But I think a 3x on your portfolio uh, some at some point through this bull market, you might not be able to realize it because you'd have to kind of sell more or less the top. I mean, these Pro are you're probably not going to sell anyways, understanding the, the, uh, the, the person's style here. But you know what? I would expect this portfolio to 3x 
in the bull market minimum. within within the next year and a half. For me, it's yeah. a minimum. Yeah. Like very minimum. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then I, and then five five to eight X would be would be on the well. He the does upper, upper he, end. he does have some coins in here that have a lot of upside. Compound being one of them, Caspa being the other one. Uh, Doge is another one. Filecoin, guys, remember Filecoin got to over two hundred dollars. Yeah. So this is an absolutely phenomenal portfolio. Um, I also wouldn't. I really wouldn't change anything, man. Um, I mean, if you're going to change something because you have Solana and Avalanche, those are pretty comparable on the, on the, on the market cap. If you wanted to take a little more risk with upside, you could, you could maybe exit one of those positions. But I mean, honestly, I mean, we're just, that's just hypothetical. Yeah. That's like super nitpicky. Yeah. But you know, like if it was me and I'm like, you know what, let me, let me see if I can hit a home run here. Sell the avalanche. You're going into bull market. You're probably going to get some massive returns from small caps. I would argue, caps. again, it's a splitting hairs here. Uh, I wouldn't get rid of avalanche because I think avalanche gives you multiple verticals exposure. You can't get rid of Solana, though. Gives you, I know. It gives you gaming. It gives you I like RWH. The, I like the compound play, man. I, I like the compound I, play, I, too. I can't even fade that, bro. I, I, that's why I look, at, I look at Solana and avalanche, and they're, very, they're like neck and neck, right? I, for me, I would be like, yo, pick one. Pick Solana or pick Avalanche. Because you got your B BTC position. That makes sense. You got your e ETH position. That makes sense. Then you got Solana and Avalanche. They're both comparable. I, I like the Solana play a little more than the Avalanche at, in this portfolio. And so I, I like the DeFi play with Compound. I would just, I would, I would fade the Avalanche. And, and then, then take that stable coin watch watch shows like ours and other shows as well do some research and then uh just snipe out some small alts as as they're starting to gain traction and then uh try to get some healthy returns on that that little six percent that that could be your play money right there and then you can really maybe 2x this whole portfolio if you nail uh if you nail it when i alts. see this robin and i'm thinking of a at the time a 24 year old who put 10,000 in the market and it was able to grow it to a million dollars in 10 years. Hmm. Um, it's hard for, for me to question their decision, but if, of course, for the sake of, you know, the show and making content and making this thing interesting, I would disagree. I would bring down my exposure to Solana just a little bit, maybe bring AVAX down just a little bit, bring compound down just a little bit, and then diversify into those things you're talking about. But Again, being extremely nitpicky. For me, this is a 10 out of 10 portfolio. So round of applause to you. I want to know what the chat thinks. Um, I think this is the best portfolio we've gotten submitted as far as what their goals are. 3 to 5x, completely doable. Uh, so big shout out. They want to remain anonymous. Thank you so much for submitting. If you want your portfolio rated live on the show, go on our Twitter, submit it via DM, or send an email to media at sincitycrypto.io. Also, a big shout out to a few new faces. We got Claude S., Mr. Kasul, uh, Zara, Monty, the Osbournes, Erica B., Bradley Clark, Daniel J., and Jason Simpson. To all of you, hola! Welcome to yeah. Sin City Crypto. Also, before I forget, I want to uh, say that uh, tonight, um, uh, so every Tuesday, Billy Goat Tales. <laughs> Uh, does a Spaces on X at 9 p.m. Eastern. I'm super excited. Uh, they were able to get Jason Brink from Gala. He's been on our show a couple times. He'll be co-hosting along with me. I'll also be co-hosting the space. So if you're a Gala fan, uh, you do not want to miss tonight's Spaces. It's going to be absolutely amazing. These guys do such a good job. So big shout out to the Billy Goat Tales team. I am super excited, man. Um, I'm stoked for, for the spaces tonight with Jason. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Um, I want to throw that out there before I forgot. Now, I do want to, Robin, uh, this is going to be rapid fire here, okay? Yo. So I just give your thoughts real quick. Here we go. Fidelity's oh. Ethereum ETF offering gets an amendment. What is the amendment? Well, it's adding staking to their application. It would be possible to stake a portion of the fund's asset with the help of a trusted staking provider. Robin, this is what we talked about. Wow. This is what we talked about, correct? How many times have we talked about this on this show? The potential, if an ETF gets approved, for them to essentially double dip. You, you make money as the price appreciates, but you also make money 
from staking rewards. Man, this is going to completely the, the, change I think the, game. the SEC, if they approve it, I feel like they're going to... Remember how they made, made the ETF applicants modify their Ten applications? Times. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to be like, hey, man, Fidelity, what are y'all doing? Especially with a lot. Take that out of there. I believe there's a few open cases with uh, staking still involved. I believe Coinbase is one of them. I think Kraken settled. Um, but, 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 but. Because, I mean, at the end of thing. the day, it gets pretty similar to revenue share but, but Robin, on, on stock. Uh, but Rob, here's my thing. Fidelity, they're not some new kid on the block. Some, They're a $4.5 trillion asset manager. And for them to amend... Their ETF to add staking, I think there's... Oh, I, I think it's genius. I like it. No, 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 no. I'm saying, I think it kind of tells us where we should expect the SEC to go with the Coinbase lawsuit, with staking as, a, as in general. I mean, I don't know, man. Is this uh, the canary in the coal mine, in the, uh, in the uh, coal mine here? Potentially. Um, I did also want to share some Cardano news. The USDM stablecoin goes live on the Cardano mainnet. Uh, issuer is looking for institutional minters of the fiat-backed stablecoin. The financial firm Mayhen launched the USDM stablecoin over the weekend, noting that institutional users would spend a day or two onboarding the asset. This is a quote from Mayhen. USDM represents a paradigm shift in the world of stablecoins, bridging the gap between traditional fiat currencies and the decentralized realm of blockchain, backed by verifiable reserves and leveraging the Cardano network's robust infrastructure USDM sets a new standard for stability, transparency, and efficiency in the digital asset space. This is something that people have been just asking for constantly. We need a Cardano native stablecoin. Well, there you have it, my friends. Also, Cardano ranks first in this major metric. And well, that is the developer activity amongst the top layer one. Cardano is consistently delivering the highest number of weekly commits. You can see here Cardano is at the very top in the weird vomit green looking color. Um, Robin, real quick, I mean, are people just sleeping on Cardano? Uh, yeah. What 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 would you tell the people who are who are thinking about selling the Cardano bag? G give us a monologue here. What should people do or think about if they're even remotely considering getting rid of the Cardano because the price hasn't moved the way they want? Mm. Go ahead. Well, uh, talk to the camera. Talk hello, to the camera. People. Talk to the people. Hello, people. Uh, first, I would um, would suggest uh, taking a look at this video right here. Mm. This is a huge Cardano rally coming. Mm. Two big catalysts. Uh, that that's a start there. Uh, also, uh, you can uh, you can go to uh, you can go to Sin City Crypto here and uh, let's see here. What else we got? There's there's a there's a lot of content here. Uh, so we also have the interview, Charles Hoskinson interview here. That's another great start right there. Smack on the homepage. Look at that. Um, that'd be my start. And second of all, I'd say, Hey, look, take a look at the chart. What did Cardano do last bull market? Uh, it went from, well, sub five cents to past $2 and 50 cents, $3, $3. There it is. So, uh, and it kind of had a late arrival to the party. The right? 60X. It, it had a late arrival as well. And the thing was, was it without went, smart contracts. It went from uh, NFTs. It went from under five cents. FIFA. And then it got up to about 40, between 40 and 70 cents. And it hung out there for a while during the, during the, the, the bull market. And so people could have still picked up Cardano uh, relatively cheap uh, under a dollar for quite some time during the last bull market when everything else was just bumping. And guess what? You can pick up Cardano again uh, under a dollar, 60 cents. And so I think the the, the ROI uh, is, is sky high on Cardano. And let's not forget, this is a retail-driven uh, product. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of retail buzz when it comes to Cardano. Uh, the masses Robin, like it. And two you cents. know what? Two cents. You know what? Retail is not jumped in yet. But when retail jumps in, I have a feeling they're going to gravitate towards Cardano again. So there you go. Awesome. Uh, guys, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Sin City Crypto One. Um, that is where we're most active. Our schedule is going to be a little wacky this week as Rob and I are both traveling and the studio is under construction. 
Oh, Gravy Train's here. Okay. Gravy Train is here. Hello, Gravy. Did you bring us coffee? No, she didn't. Of course she didn't. Of course. Mm. The girl who wants a raise every week um, can't even get us coffee. Say hi to the camera. Hey. Um, so, again, uh, we are building out the best production in all of YouTube. And so, uh, Gravy Train drinks, uh, what is this? Hazelnut, oak, shaken, iced, green, matcha. I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of letters in here. Do they have that in Italy, Rocco? No, thanks God. But, but, but mm. awfully, they do have spoons for frappuccinos. I'll tell you that. Pretty good. But you uh, know what? We don't have a frappuccino. That's why. Oh, thanks so it's God. all new to you then. Yeah, thanks God. Okay, well here I'll give you some advice. With the frappuccinos here, we drink them with straws. Oh wow. What about the whipped cream? What do you do with that? Whipped cream, you you lick it, of course. Exactly. Like a camel. And then uh, have you not seen that movie? What was that movie, by the way? <laughs> I don't know. The whipped cream. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Space Ape, Alpha Hotel, Roger Smith, and Ricardo. Uh, to all of you. Hola! Well, yeah. Ricardo, interesting. Okay. Uh, all right, guys, that'll do it today. Today's video that's coming later will be on Avalanche. Is Avalanche going to follow in, follow in the footsteps of Solana and see a massive rally like Solana did? I paint a picture, and the answer is probably yes. So... You're going to want to watch the video. If you're a member, you get access first. It'll go live a few hours later. Uh, and come join us at Billy Go Tales on the Twitter space. Super excited. Rocco, what the are you doing? Did I do the tornado? Want me to go to credit? Yeah. Do it. Sin City Crypto. Everybody know we here for entertainment and info. Gonna show you how to get that big dough. So every day stay tapped in. For big facts, no cap in. With Bitcoin, if you're in, then you win. We divide the pie with no fraction. It's Big Rob, David. I split the game, but they gave it. Name the coin that's your favorite. I got dry powder, why save it? To the OGs, new beginners. Special shout out to the well members. Buy a dip, sell winners. Ain't really nothing you can tell sinners. Tune in for the latest new flavors. They gonna teach us mean coins. They polarizing like barbecue chicken pizzas. I laugh with a major grin. Lag as we trade them in. Baddies, they came to sin. And sinners gonna play to win. Screaming, hola. Till my bags are flowing over. Hold ya. To the moon and to the solar. Won't I? Don't be letting FOMO control ya. It's over when the finger tornado close ya.